Tara, Wednesday, she was sick, and she's like the glue that holds us together. And, uh, boy, it was not uh, exciting Wednesday. And then this morning we struggled through it, and uh, it was not so good. But if you're really looking for bad, let's look at today's message. <laughs> this will make all the music sound beautiful. Bibles and turn to the end of Genesis chapter 50. We're going to look at verses 22 and 23. 22 and 23. I think this is a good place to kind of pause and reflect on the book of Genesis and its major theme. For me, the major theme of Genesis uh, has been family. Often Genesis is outlined by events or episodes like creation. And after creation, you had the fall, then the flood, then Abraham's years without children, the birth of Isaac, and then so on and so on. But I'm going to submit to you an outline, not focused on events, but families. We begin with the creation event at the beginning of Genesis, and we move to the focus on families. If you want to follow along, you're welcome to, and just to thumb through your Bible. But the first one I want to t uh, focus on is, notice in chapter 2, verse 4. It says the records of the heavens and earth. That kind of ended where the creation event ended as far as the telling of the story. And then there's a shift in creation event to Adam's family. <laughs> I guess Adam's family works. <laughs> in chapter 5, verse 1. It says uh, these are the generations. Or some of your Bibles might say something a little different. These are the records. And it says the records of Adam's family. And then the next record is in Noah's family in chapter 6, verse 9. From there, it's about his children in chapter 10, verse 1. And then specifically, the family of Shem, who would be the holy family, the, the family that responded to the grace of God working in their lives. And that's found in chapter 11, verse 10. These are the records of Shem or the generations of Shem. Then Terah, Abraham's father, in chapter 11, verse 27. And then Sam, Abraham's son, Ishmael, in chapter 25, verse 12. And then his son Isaac, in chapter 25, verse 19. Then Esau, in chapter 36, verse 1, and also in verse 9. And then the account of Jacob, in chapter 37, verse 2. Each one of those places, I don't think it's an accident, but it's a reminder that these are the generation. These are the records of these specific families. So that Genesis is not a focus on events as much as it is a focus on what God was doing in families. Chapter 49 through 50 is the account of God's working in this major family. The one he was blessing, Jacob's family. We see that in Jacob's blessing each of his sons. This was the wonderful family God was going to use from then on out to bring the message of hope and salvation and purpose and meaning to life. Our passage this morning is a reminder of God blessing the family as Joseph, in this case, is truly blessed. Think about it. Verse 22. Joseph and his father's household remained in Egypt. Joseph lived 110 years. Now you've got to move quickly because what we find is that he, his dad died at age 56. So now we're already, we just buried dad. Now we just jump 54 years. He lived 110 years. He saw Ephraim's sons to the third generation. And the sons of Manasseh, Micar, were recognized by Joseph, his great-grandson from that son. Now, what a blessing to be able to spend all that time watching your family grow, numerically, but also spiritually. 54 years, I don't think he was just biding his time. They were placed on his knee. It was a recognition these children are important to me and I'm important to them. And he took time and effort, no doubt, to tell them about the things of faith, the history that had gone on. 
This was a wonderful moment for a grandpa, great grandpa, great great grandpa, great 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 grandpa to be able to do this for his for his family. What a blessing to be able to do that. But the focus here, I think, through Genesis has been on families. So don't miss that and the importance and the value of family. Let's look at uh, what I have outlined for you this morning to kind of point your minds to and direction to and thoughts to. And that is what God does with families. Number one, God's blessing of family. God gave us families. That's what he did in the beginning. God gave us families. Adam and Eve. It wasn't good for Adam to be alone, was it? He gave him Eve. And what was his first response when he saw her? Whoa, Whoa man. Whoa, man. That's how she got her name. Whoa, man. And so he looked at her and said, Whoa, man. And, and obviously he was so attracted to her, soon they had children. And a family was born. Our culture... Number, letter A, our culture has a need for family. I look at our culture today and so many people are lonely. So many people feel like they're left out. Our culture is characterized by individualism and suffers from geographic mobility, which has resulted in the loss of family value, effectiveness, and influence. Think about it. When children run up to college, just in that small case, what happens to so many children? You know, in Christendom, in church life, that 8 out of 10 children that leave the family nucleus and go off to college in Christian homes, 8 out of 10 turn from their faith as they go to college. The influence of family. Genesis teaches us the importance and the need for people to be part of a family. King David said it this way in Psalm 68, verse 6. God provides homes for those who are deserted. And you can feel deserted within your own family, your nucleus family, your biological family. Right? I mean, especially becoming a Christian. If your family is not a Christian and you become a Christian, you're like a, a weird duck. And they uh, kind of frown on you. You're not invited to things and maybe not even asked to be a a, a part of uh, family get-togethers, but you kind of become ostracized a bit. You may feel ostracized. Jesus said it this way concerning families. He said, I came to turn a man against his father. Wait a minute, Jesus, I thought families were important. What do you see when individuals have different focus and desires and passions that their separation can come. And when you have a passion and desire from God and the world around you, even your biological family doesn't, there can be true separation there. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And so as a result, you can be separated from family. For those, I believe the church serves as a family for which the Bible tells us the church is referred to as the family of God or the household of God. Those who are neglected, abandoned, set aside because of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the church has to be a family for them. But we wrap our arms around them, we love them and Most importantly, we kid with them. But we let them know that they belong here, right? Every person that walks through this door that knows Jesus Christ and wants to be a part of a family, I'm ready to adopt them. And I believe you are too. We want them to be a part of what God is doing here. What about those who have deserted their family due to economy, vocation, or other things? And especially the gospel of Jesus. Jesus referred to these individuals this way. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 48 through 50. He was still speaking to the crowds when suddenly his mother and brothers were standing outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. But he replied to the one who told him, who is my mother and who is my brothers? And stretching out his hands toward his disciples, 
he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father, that person is my brother, sister, and mother. Isn't that powerful? Who's my family? I have a bi biological family, and they're a wonderful family. I'm blessed to be able to know them. And I want to have an impact and influence on their lives. But who's my family? Jesus said, my family are those who do the will of the Father. It's nice if your biological family does the will of the Father, right? And that's what we need to do. We need to be about the task of sharing with them our faith and our confidence and our trust in the Lord that hopefully God will do the same work in their lives. But those who do the will of the Father, we're family. That's how we should refer to each other. That's why we call each other's brothers and sisters in Christ. We're family. And I, I love that our name of our church is called Family of Faith Fellowship. Because I believe that's what God intended in Genesis to remind us of the importance of family, but also to remind us that there's a world around us that is in need of a loving, caring, compassionate family. And we provide them the opportunity to be welcomed and loved and to be a part of what's here as God works in their lives and ours too. Now, as though the world kind of needs a family, may not be looking for it, but they need it, let her be. Joseph, he sees his family restored. So I want you to see Joseph's restored family. Verse 22. He went back to Egypt. Remember I told you 110 years old? He, he died at 110, so 54 years he has this opportunity to be with his, his family. His loss was regained. Back when he was 17 years old, you'll remember that that's when his brother sold him into slavery. He went off into Egypt. Was he with his family? No, nothing. And what happened? God blessed him with two sons. One he called Ephraim. And he said... Uh, he, and, and then also he had another son, Manasseh. But we can see that in Joseph, when his loss was regained, we can see that he had sons, the third generations, and sons of Manasseh, uh, his, his son Micar, were recognized by Joseph. So 17 years of separation, and then he returns back to Egypt. He goes through this difficulty. God gives him two sons, and, and, and then uh, he has this restored time with his father. And that's what's interesting about the restored time of his father. He had the same amount of years with his dad that he lost when he was a kid. He had 17 years with his dad after his dad came to Egypt. And Joseph, at 56, his dad died when he was 110. But not only did he have his family, but he had his family, number two, multiplied. He had his family multiplied. They grew. The family grew. Yeah, and that's, that seems to be characteristic of a loving, caring, compassionate family. I, you know, I, I know our church is going to grow. Do you believe that? I believe a family that loves each other like we do, we're going to grow. And we're building a strong nucleus here. We're loving each other, caring for each other. And then we're going to continue to be warm toward each other. And, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We're, we're going to grow. God's going to... He, he doesn't put babies in cold incubators. He puts them in warm places where they're going to be nurtured. And that's what we provide for people that God's working in their lives. So they multiplied. And, and so Joseph named his first. Remember, Joseph was blessed while he was in Egypt. He gave him two sons. We see in chapter 41, verses 51 to 52, he named his first son Manasseh. And God made me forget all my hardship in my father's household. And verse 52, he gave him a son Ephraim. And God made me fruitful in the land of my affliction and then it tells us that he saw Ephraim's son to the third generation Manasseh's son Makar was also recognized by Joseph and Ephraim's great grandchildren and Manasseh's great his great great grandchildren and Manasseh's great grandchildren so what a blessing what a blessing to, to have that uh, happen where he was able to have more influence on those individuals God was blessing him with. All right, so can you see the importance of family? Don't ever, don't ever let that go. We need to continue to value that here as a church, family. Number two, God's blessing in family. Letter A, 
passing on the gospel. Uh, there, there's no doubt what was happening here was a beautiful thing of, of Joseph blessing his great-great-grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and his sons, too, and his grandchildren by being able to share with them the things of faith that he learned from his father and his grandfather. It tells us that in verse 23, uh, Manasseh, my Bible says, uh, Makar, his sons were recognized by Joseph. Now, if you have a King James Bible, it might say something like this. They were, no, it will say something like this. <laughs> they were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Now, that can also refer to as a ritual of adoption or legitimizing. He was basically saying, these are mine. Do you ever think of that, the children that are part of our family here at church? Have you thought about these little ones as being your children? Do you, do you get that? You know, it's nice to give them up to their parents for most of the time, but do you recognize the responsibility we have for those children here? The life that we live, they, they look at us. They watch us. And we have a responsibility not to share the gospel with them. But I don't mean just how to get saved. The gospel is more than just repenting of your sin, turning to Christ in trust and forgiveness, and having a relationship with him. The gospel is also teaching them to obey all the things God has commanded. See, that's our job. These are our children. Yes, biologically, they belong to those parents. And we're thankful they go home with them at night. But the point is, we have a spiritual responsibility to care for them by passing on to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only in our words, but also in our actions. So God gave us a family. This is a structure through which the gospel is passed on. Can't you see it? Where do they get all these stories? When you think of Genesis and, 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 and you go back and you say, Moses, how did you find out about the creation story? Well, I interviewed Adam. No, you didn't interview Adam. He was already gone by the time, time you came around. Somebody passed those stories on. And when Joseph had them, he had his grandchildren, great-grandchildren on his knees, and he passed those stories on to them, and they continue to pass it on to them. Here's what God expects from us. This is how God wants to, us to live. Here's what God has done, and he wants to do it in your life too. That's our job. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 through 6, when God told him not to bow down and worship idols, he said, I'm a jealous God. I'm punishing the children for their father's sin to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You just become that channel through which God works to bless those who come after us or come to us. At Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, he says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So the, gospel, the family is there for the structure to which God wants us to pass on the gospel. Letter B, the family is also a place where we have a genuine concern for the brethren. Here, here is what's really going to make an impact on people's lives. When you and I generally care to meet their needs. When they come to this place, they come to this family, they have needs. We need to be at the task of meeting those needs. David has a wonderful structure in our Sunday school class. It actually has an opportunity for someone to lead a class to minister to those who are part of the class, thus ministering to the entire body. Those who come our way, we have an opportunity to show them the love of God by the way we care for them. So I want you to really look at opportunities for those who come our way to find out about them and to know what's going on in their lives and maybe take the opportunity to demonstrate love through caring, compassion. You know, we do have the responsibility to take care of each other. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, we must work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another. D don't you want to be an encouragement to each other? Hey, you're going through a tough time. You're going to make it. Matter of fact, we're going to support you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to be there for you. We will encourage you through this process. And building each other up as you are already doing. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. Just our mere presence and I, I know some of you, at times, you probably need to be home instead of being in a prayer meeting or a, a Bible study or a worship time. You probably feel miserable. You're probably hurting. And you show up here. And I'm thinking, you know what? You have just encouraged me like you could not imagine. You didn't take this as an opportunity to stay away, but you took this as an opportunity to come and, and, and to, to demonstrate the importance and the value of this family. And when you do that, that is an encouragement. And when you don't do that, you know what it is? It's a discouragement. And the last thing we want to do is discourage each other. Take the opportunities to encourage each other. First Peter said, in First Peter we're told in chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, Above all, maintain an intense love for each other. Since love covers a multitude of sins, be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. Let us see. And then a genuine testimony of the gospel. Uh, and, and, there, and there goes back to the example that we set. We need to set an example by the way we conduct our lives. That has the greatest impact for people to who knew you before Christ and how they know you now. You know, you have a great witnessing opportunity. That's why many new Christians seem to be evangelists. Because people knew them before they came to Christ and surrendered their life, and now they see them differently, and they say, what happened to you? You are so different now. But that doesn't mean you and I lose our evangelism potential because we're more seasoned as Christians. We still need to maintain a lifestyle that demonstrates we are different. We have a king we adhere to who is different than the Lord and the God of this world. We have a king who has risen from the dead, who has saved us from our sins, who has seated on high, who, and who is in control. We have this God for which we serve. And yes, we do act differently because we do serve such a God. Timothy, Paul said to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 12, let no one despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. We have the responsibility to set the prime example of what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ. And Titus chapter 2, verse 7, make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. One of the greatest encouragements I got as a new Christian was from my pastor. I had made application six years, or about, it was probably about eight months. Eight months after I moved from, Heather and I moved from Ohio, moved to Missouri. And at that time, God called me into ministry. And that was that time that I surrendered to go to seminary also. And I needed a letter of recommendation. And I asked my pastor back in Ohio if he would do that. And one of the things he said in that letter was this. That I was an example of the life transforming and changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you what God does in a person's life when they come into his life. When he comes into that person's life, their lives are transformed by the power and the working of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people ought to know the difference in our lives, and we need to show them. 
This is not a laissez-faire type operation we have concerning the kingdom of God. This is a lifestyle and a practice and a conduct and a speech that demonstrates the changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take this opportunity in the family to do those things. Be a genuine testimony. Be an encouragement. Have a genuine concern for the brethren and take this opportunity to pass the gospel on to others. Now, a third thing, and I, and I close with this. You filling all the notes? Very good. A girl? God's blessing through family. Don't miss this point. Yes, we, we recognize our need to be part of family, what we do to encourage each other in the gospel by being that family. But God's blessing through family. Letter A. This is God's original plan. This was God's original plan. To take families, bless them, that they would be a blessing to others. He told Abraham this. Oh, it was Abram at that time. Chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. Or basically, I'll make you a great family. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That's what God does. He blesses others through the family. Yes, in the family, but also through the family. God blessed Abraham, didn't he? Abraham blessed Isaac. Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob blessed his children. And his children were told to go and to bless the world. That was their responsibility. Letter B. God's omnipotent provision. All right, if we're going to be a blessing, guess what? God gives us what we need to bless. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8-10, through 10, And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he scattered, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and the bread for the food will provide and multiply your seed and increase your harvest for your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. You know, they were the original family, and I shared this in a Sunday school class. God chose Israel as the original family through which he would bless the world. They blew it. They blew it. And so God gave it to the Gentiles. He's given it to the church. He's given us the responsibility through which he is going to use us, providing everything we need to bless this world around us so that they too will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and become part of the greater family of God. And this is God's ongoing purpose. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited, credited to him for righteousness, then understand that those who have faith are Abraham's son. So you have faith? I got faith. Yes, I do. I got faith. How about you? I'm back over here. We, we got faith. So guess who you are a family of? You're a part of Abraham's family. And then we could stomp our feet, Father Abraham had many sons. And I'm one of them. And so are you. Now the scriptures saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham saying, all nations will be blessed through you. Verse 9. So those who have faith are blessed with Abraham who had faith. So just as God used Abraham back then, he used his family all the way through, and he continues to use his family. Those through faith have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's still his ongoing purpose for the family. So number one, proclaim, proclaim the good news. Proclaim the gospel. Now the scripture saw in vast, and you know, that we're supposed to play, um, it says, now, the scriptures saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and told the good news ahead of time to Abraham, saying, all nations be blessed through you. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. 
Because it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles. That's you and me. Anybody a Jew here? We just all know one, right? But we are Gentiles. Through the Gentiles. By Jesus Christ. So that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, proclaiming the good news is our responsibility. In letter A, you're blessed if you receive it. This has been the blessing that God has been promising that he would give to his people. That one day the Messiah would come to redeem all of lost humanity. He would hang on the tree for you and me. He would give his life for ours. And if we receive what Christ has done for you, receive him into your life, we would be blessed. In first. In John chapter 1, verse 12, but all who did receive him, he gave them to re- the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Do you, can you think of a greater blessing to be, than be part of God's family? There isn't. I, I, I mean, let me, can I tell you this short story? There was a seminary professor. Uh, I can make it a long story too. But there was a sem- seminary professor who was in a restaurant with his family. He was away from town. He was in Tennessee. He saw a man, elderly man, walking around shaking everybody's hand. And he thought to himself, oh boy, I don't need any of this on vacation. And he thought for sure he was going to approach his table. He turned to his wife and said, I hope this guy doesn't show up. Well, the guy did show up and shook his hand. He said, where are you all from? They said, Oklahoma. And he said, Oklahoma, never been there. I heard it's a nice place. He said, what do you do in Oklahoma? He said, well, I teach uh, hermeneutics to seminary, prof- or seminary students. He says, oh, you teach preachers how to preach? He said, uh, yeah, that's basically what I do. He said, well, let me tell you a story. And he sat down. And the seminary professor said, oh, no, here we go. So he sat down. He said, you see those mountains over there? At the foot of the mountains was a little boy. And uh, he was raised by a mom. And he never knew his dad. They never married. And he said, all through his life, everybody would ask him, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? And he just got tired of it. When people would ask that question, who's your daddy? He got tired of it. One day, as he grew older, he went to church. And while he was at church, a new preacher came to town. And the new preacher didn't know him. And as customary people were leaving, the pastor would stand back there. And a little boy tried his best to sneak past because he knew the pastor would not knowing him would ask him, who's his daddy? Well, a uh, boy approached him. He couldn't sneak around him. And the pastor turned to him. And the whole church shuddered. They knew what was going to happen because this boy was so embarrassed by this. And he said... He looked at the little boy and he asked him his name. He said, who's your, who's your daddy? And the little boy stopped in his tracks and just hung his head. He said, let me tell you, little boy. Do you know Jesus? The little boy said, yeah. He said, you have a daddy. You have a daddy in heaven. You have a daddy who created all things, has given you all things. You have a daddy who loves you and will care for you the rest of your life. That's your daddy. He's your heavenly father. He said, you know, that little boy walked out of there with his head held high and proud from that day forward. And at that point, the seminary professor looked at his wife and sheepishly looked at her and thought, man, man, that that was wonderful. I can't believe I didn't want that guy to sit down and talk to us. And the guy walked up, started walking away, and he said, by the way, my name is Mr. Hooper. And he said, I was that little boy. And they asked him, they said, uh, that guy, he come around here often? He said, yeah, he was the governor of Tennessee years ago. And he comes in here and just shares with people what God has done in his life. You know, you're a child of God. You have a heavenly father who loves you and cares for you. He's our Father. He's given us a right to become His children. And we are blessed. The poor in spirit are blessed. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn are blessed. The gentle are blessed. In in verse 6 of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew, the hunger, the, the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're blessed. The merciful are blessed. The pure in heart are blessed. The peacemakers are blessed. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed. You are blessed when you're insulted and persecuted falsely for every kind of evil against you because of me. 
be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not only do we have the responsibility of the gospel, not only do we have the blessing of receiving it, we have the blessing of proclaiming it. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the herald who proclaims peace, who brings news of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. That's our job. Proclaim it. Jesus said it this way. He came near to his disciples and he said, all authority has been given to me, both in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even till the ends of the earth. That's what a family does. That's what we're about. And God wants to use us to impact this community with the good news of Jesus Christ and love those people and be used by God to impact their lives so they will grow and become faithful followers of Christ and do likewise. Genesis is about families, not events. The gospel is not about an event in your life. It's about being part of a family. And if you're not part of a family, guess what? There's a family here who would love to have you to be a part of it. So that we might know you, grow with you, and to go with you. For the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you.